Please be seated. Good morning, church family. We are officially, as you can tell, in Christmas mode. Uh, there's actually a switch somewhere in the back, and I say, Kenny Weaver, pull the switch. And he does. And now we're, we're, now we're in Christmas mode. Uh, so uh, I don't think I said it last week. I want to say it this week. Thank you to everybody who helped uh, put up some of these Christmas decorations. Uh, really, really helps uh, get in the mood, the Christmas mood. And uh, I won't tell you which one of those spiral um, greeneries up the, that I participated in, but it's the worst of the two is the one. So uh, learned a lot of lessons that night. Anyway, the weather lately has felt a lot like fall. I haven't really gotten my Christmas vibes when it comes to weather yet. Don't know if you have, but, um, you know, maybe a white Christmas, probably not. Um, I've lived in several places throughout my life now, as I was thinking about all the places I've lived and experienced a Christmas, you know, Central Florida, Memphis, Colorado, Texas, now back to Memphis, you know. So I'm um, just going to tell you, Colorado has the, the whitest Christmas, as you probably guessed. We are uh, indefinitely pausing our series in the book of Acts, and I'm certain someday we'll come back to it because we do have chapters 21 through 28 as Paul is going to stand trial for his faith and be kind of shuffled back and forth between magistrates. And uh, there will be a, a day that we finish that, but it's not going to be for a little while. So we'll push pause on that. And I want to introduce you to a three-part series today that will take us uh, through Christmas Eve Sunday. Uh, Sunday and Christmas Eve are the same day this year. So um, we're going to conclude on that day, uh, titling this short series, The Arrival of the King, The Arrival of the King. Um, how many of you would say Christmas is, in fact, your favorite holiday of the year? And be willing to put your hands up. Okay. I'd say about half of you. That's a pretty good representation. I do like Christmas a lot. I don't know if it's my favorite. Um, I, I love Thanksgiving is a food holiday, so that's, that's one of my favorites. But um, I think I, I, as, you get, as you have kids, too, if, when you have little kids, Christmas is at its peak fun. So I'm at, like, peak fun Christmas right now. Um, but Christmas is certainly a cultural favorite, I think we can say, and that's evidenced by the fact that Christmas has crept back and eaten Thanksgiving and continues to creep back, and I think Halloween's in danger. It's the only blockade from keeping Christmas from becoming the entire season, um, but that just tells us how much people love Christmas. Our culture has kind of been dealing with this uh, divide between culture Christmas and Christian Christmas for a while now. And, and my guess is that all of us are mature enough to celebrate both of those things at the same time. We can celebrate uh, Nordic winter culture with fake snow and fir trees and Christmas villages on the mantle and hot chocolate. And we can enjoy a, a nutcracker and a candy cane and gifts and stockings and I think we can do that without losing our minds that somehow God's uh, glory is being minimized. Uh, we can enjoy created things as long as we recognize the superiority of the Creator and reserve our greatest love and affection for Him. And I think our culture actually does a good job on the cultural Christmas part. Uh, they, you can see a lot of cool things. You can go to see the Starry Nights and drive through Shelby Farms, and it's a great drive, and there's all sorts of great things you can do in town for Christmas, but Nobody else is going to do what only the church can do. Nobody else is going to say things that we're going to say around Christmas time, which is why we really need to dial in and make our approach to Christmas the one that magnifies Jesus above all else. To look at the first coming of Christ as the arrival of the King into the world to save sinners like you and me. That's the theme of Christi uh, Christmas that only Christians will drive home. And so we have an opportunity to do that in this series, and that's exactly what I want to do. The true meaning of Christmas, that our King came. The Word took on flesh and dwelt among us. He showed up for us. God went on a mission trip for us. He arrived in Bethlehem and lived a full life for us. And so these three messages in the series will not primarily be informational walkthroughs of the Christmas story, although I would like to preach that someday as well. Um, these will be three descriptors of the coming of Jesus, three adverbs, if you will, uh, to describe the manner of his coming. In other words, we already affirm that Christ came, um, and, and so now we're going to look at how he came. 
And even in so, how those things tell us about what his, the remainder of his life would be, what's, uh, what his death would be. Uh, so we're going to look at all of those things. And today's message, probably of the three, is the most out of the box. Uh, and it is titled, The Auspicious Arrival of the King. No, that's not all spice, just put uh, in a different way. No, auspicious is an SAT word for, for you high schoolers. And uh, it perfectly, perfectly describes the point that I want to make to you today, and we're going to go over that in Galatians 4, 4. So the main idea for today's message, I want to show you that Jesus arrived into our world at the exact appointed time ordained by God, allowing him to have the greatest impact possible. And as we look at the message, I want you to be able to rejoice in the providence of God as he sent Jesus Yes, to the world, but also to you at the right time. We're going to praise God for the blessing of Christ coming to us. So if you would, let's pray one more time and prepare our hearts. Lord, we ask a special blessing now in this moment as we open your word, that you would use it to move mightily in our hearts and minds and our spirits. God, you would take this moment as a small offering from us that we've given to you. Lord, that you would multiply it and that you would do a work in somebody's heart and life today through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So every week we'll have a different key text. This one is uh, Galatians 4, which happens to be our memory verse. Uh, and so Christmas in Galatians. The Apostle Paul, in his defense of the gospel, uh, in the book of Galatians, gives some info that's actually really good for a Christmas message. Uh, and that's going to be what we look at today. So Galatians 4, 3 through 7. We'll read up front. Paul writes, In the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Now remember, verse 4 is really the focus. That phrase, you may even want to underline it if you do that in your Bible. The fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son. What is the fullness of time and why should we care? Well, it's actually really important because Paul says Jesus was sent into the world by the Father at a specific moment in time, and that moment was the fullness of time. Now, you might want to know what that word means. If anyone says something happened at the fullness of time, I would want to know what's going on in that time, and why is it full? Well, Jesus came not in a randomness of time, but in a fullness of time. Now, I will tell you what that word auspicious means now. So get your, uh, get your pens handy. And uh, if you already knew it, I just want you to feel some pride in your heart today. It means favorable or conducive to success. Conducive to success. And so an auspicious moment in time would, would be the moment where it's the most favorable for something to happen. Just in time, or in the words of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, not too hot, not too cold, but what? Just right. Okay. Many of you, Porridge fans, anyone? No? Okay. Many of you are sports fans. Um, you may not use this word as you, uh, as you watch football games. In fact, if you do, I'm going to tell you, stop right now. Uh, this is the most auspicious moment of the football game, ladies and gentlemen. Please don't do that if you're hanging out with your friends. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about what that can be. You know that moment in a game, you're watching a game with your friends, and it's Maybe you're down, your team's a little down and you need a comeback in order to make it work and you can see the clock is kind of going down. And there's that, everyone just knows. You look at your, your friends, you look at everyone watching the game with you and you say, if we're gonna do this, if we're gonna make the comeback, we gotta do it right now. This drive has to be the drive. Or if you're on defense, this is the stop. We need this stop or we're gonna lose the game. You know that moment in the game? That's the auspicious moment of the football game where it all comes down to this perfect moment for success to happen. Another way to think about it is 
if you're harvesting a crop, I know some of y'all have gardens, some of y'all have uh, maybe owned a, a fruit tree at some point in your life, but there's a perfect moment to pick the fruit from the tree, right? So you go a little too early, you know, you got that that green banana that nobody wants at the store quite yet, and it's still going to sit there for a while, or too late, you got the brown falling half apart, you know, banana, you got it's got to pick it at the perfect time. So Paul says Jesus came into the world in the auspicious moment, the fullness of time, the right moment. And the reason this is a Christmas message is because perhaps we could say that Christmas Day is the most auspicious day in history, at least up till that point. So I want to make three affirmations to you to support the auspicious arrival of Christ as we dig into this concept. Number one, we're going to affirm God orders the timing of history. God orders the timing of history. So let's really dig into the fullness of time because really my whole argument rests upon that. The Greek says when the Pleroma to Kranu came, God sent his son. So you hear in the word Kranu, right? Kranos. That's where our word time comes from, chronological. Now, onto Pleroma, which is behind fullness, it refers to a full measure of something, a completedness of something, the end of something. Same word is used by Mark in the Gospels to describe the full baskets of leftover fish and loaves the disciples collected after feeding the 5,000. They said the baskets were pleroma afterwards. Meaning what? They were full up. They were full baskets. Paul used this phrase to describe the deity of Christ in Philippians 2 when he says the fullness of God, the pleroma of God, dwelled bodily in Christ Jesus. In other words, the amount of God that was in Christ was pleroma. It was full to the top. He was fully God, as we say. And so we look at Paul's phrasing that Jesus came into the world at the pleroma of time. Jesus entered the world at peak ripeness for a Savior and for a gospel message to go forward. At this point, you're probably saying, give me some examples. I have come prepared with some examples. So I would like to make you think today... Um, and and certain things that line up really well in the time that Jesus was born. Fascinating stuff to think about. Um, Now, this is history. This is not necessarily biblical, although it lines up with the Bible, but it seems that God has ordained history up till this point, and it seems that God has caused Jesus to be born perfectly right in this time for a reason. So what could those reasons be. I have three that I want to just give you. There were certainly more. These are three that I thought of. Number one, Jesus was born sometime between four and six BC, right? Right? Not zero. Don't be out there on trivia shows embarrassing me, okay? Not zero. Uh, Sometime between four and six BC. This was right at the transitional moment of power between the old Greek empire waning in their power, and the new upcoming Roman Empire growing in their power. Um, Alexander the Great was a Greek, and he had dominated the world centuries earlier for Greece and left a massive cultural uh, fingerprint of Greek culture across the conquered world. One of the greatest things that he did as far as influence was everybody now spoke Greek all over the empire. It's called Koine Greek, Koine Greek, which is not the same as classical Greek. This is the language of the New Testament and was likely the best known language to the largest number of people at any time in human history up to this point. So outside of Babel, this is probably the most people speaking one language on the earth up until this moment in time. Having a common language would make the spreading of a message, ding, ding, the spreading of a new message, the gospel, more efficient than any other time in human history. If there was ever a time when good news was to be shared, spread, and told, how about the peak moment when the most people spoke the same language? That's number one. Um, Number two... What about missionary travel? Not only was the language right, what about missionary travel? Whereas Greece wanted a cultural revolution, 
Rome wanted a military revolution. And because Rome was actually in charge uh, when Jesus was born, uh, there, there, there was a thing, we call it now, they didn't call it at the time, but historians look back and say so there was something called Pax Romana. Pax Romana. Everybody heard that from history class? Remember that word? Okay, it's a thing, all right? And it uh, is what they would say happened between 27 B.C. and 180 A.D., a unique period in time. Pax Romana is when there was a relative peace and stability in the Roman Empire, and they sought to expand their infrastructure. They wanted to expand their travel infrastructure so that their massive Roman armies could go anywhere they wanted to go on big, wide, paved, nice roads. So right as the Great Commission is being given, it's in the middle of the world's largest infrastructure expansion program on Rome's dime. The Roman Empire constructed what we might call the interstate system so that the big horses and siege weapons could pass through on nice roads. This happened right at the moment when uh, there was supposed to be a missionary movement across the world. Coincidence? I think not. Thirdly, the Roman Empire was unique to other conquering empires in that they allowed the Jews to have their temple and to worship God as long as they paid taxes and didn't cause too much trouble. Not every dominant world power did this. Not every dominant world power that conquered another nation let them still keep their nation going. Okay, Babylon did not do that. Assyria did not do that. Rome let Jews be Jews as long as they played some political ball and caused no trouble in the bigger picture. This allowed the Jews to still worship. It allowed them to still gather, to still actually be able to long for a Messiah. So Jesus was born, this is really important, into an Israel with an operational temple. That's really important. Uh, that would not have been true a few centuries earlier if Jesus were born in exile, for example. Think about the practical implications if Babylon or Assyria or the Ottoman Empire were in charge when Jesus was born. Think about how Jesus' life and ministry would be different if there was no temple. The cleansing of the nothing. Yeah, it wouldn't have happened. There were no synagogues. He couldn't just walk in and take up the scroll and read it to them. No Pharisees to slap on the wrist or reform. No Jewish law to keep. How many prophecies would have fallen flat if Jesus were born without a fully functioning Israel? Again, this is historical conjecture. Um, but I don't think there's any way you look at that and say that's coincidental. That's the power of God on display. We know God manipulates the affairs of nations, the rising and falling of empires, the succession of monarchs, the outcome of battles, the advancements of technology and culture that led to an auspicious moment for his son to come into the world and change it forever. History is not random. Stuff does not just happen. To understand that Jesus came in the fullness of time requires that we affirm God orders the events of history to accommodate his purposes. That's the first affirmation. Secondly, we must affirm Jesus arrived as a solution to the law, as a solution to the law. In Galatians 4.4, 4, Paul does not just randomly state Jesus came in the fullness of time. No, it's actually in the middle of an argument that he's making about the Jewish law delivered by Moses. Now, why would, be, why would Paul be bringing the birth of Jesus up in a conversation where he's correcting the Galatian church about their law keeping? What, what does that have to do with anything? Well, the church that Paul had planted in Galatia had been infiltrated by false teachers who claimed that salvation required faith in Christ and faith uh, adherence to the Jewish law. So in other words, they're saying, if you just believe in Christ, that's not good enough. You must believe in Christ and keep all the Old Testament laws. And this was Paul's reason for writing Galatians. He's combating that concept. And so if we read backwards into our text, we see um, a few verses up why Paul said what he said. 
So let's look at Galatians 3.23. So go up just a little bit. Galatians 3.23 to kind of see why Paul said this in Galatians 4.4. 4. He says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So let's pause there. Paul is clearly stating the Old Testament was always a means uh, to a, it was a temporary measure until the revealing of Christ. It was a guardian. It restrained sin. It revealed God's character. But it was always intended to be a temporary measure. Paul says the law held them captive. It was imprisoning them. Now, what what does that mean? It means the law did not have the capability to clean up a sinner. It could only condemn a sinner. Faith can justify. Law can condemn. And that's why faith in Christ is superior to law. So let's continue on. Galatians 3.25 It says, But now that faith has come, meaning faith in Christ has come, we are no longer under a guardian, a.k.a. the law. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So because of the arrival of Christ, the relationship of God's people to the law changed. And that's great news because the law is an unflinching master. Have you ever known someone that said something like, Ah, religion is just a bunch of rules. You ever known someone that said that? Or, I might become a Christian, but it, it just seems I, I couldn't measure up to all those rules. Well, here's a Christmas message for you. Nobody ever could, and nobody ever did. So God sent his son into the world to do what you're worried that you cannot do. Christianity is comprised of people, people who all agree together together that we don't measure up, which is why we need Christ, and which is why he showed up in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago to start a law-keeping mission that you could never accomplish. That's the point. That's why he came. Freedom from impossible standards and your inability to keep them. Jesus is a living, breathing solution to the inadequacies of the law of Moses. If you have read one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then you know that the Jewish leaders at the time of Jesus became absolutely obsessed with law-keeping. And we know there's some good reasons why they did. When you get sent into captivity twice because you didn't follow the Lord, you understand there can be some, hey, let's, let's tighten up, okay? But they were so obsessed with the law, they often missed the intent of the law, and dishonored God in the way that they abused people and abused the law. People were crushed under their inability to keep the law, and it was so impossible that the Pharisees were created to have their full-time job just be to keep the law. It was high time that grace and forgiveness be extended to God's people. And so Jesus arrived to be the grace release valve for the intense law-keeping pressure that had built up in God's people. We can say Jesus arrived not only at the auspicious historical moment for maximum impact, but at the auspicious theological moment for maximum impact. There was no better time for the embodiments of faith and grace to appear than in the height of the Pharisaic law-keeping movement. The people who were weary and heavy laden needed rest. Our modern culture has Pharisees today. Did you know that? We got Pharisees today. We just don't call them that. They don't wear funny clothes. Um, everyone cries for tolerance, but nobody actually believes it, right? I mean, forgiveness is hard to come by in our polarized moment where everything you say is recorded and potentially held against you for some future moment when you achieve success. Uh, you will never be ideologically pure enough for whatever political movement you follow. Public apologies may be made, but they often sound like hostage tapes and are written by overpaid PR firms on retainer. 
In fact, I would say that one of the defining hallmarks of our cultural moment today is that you can never be forgiven of your sins. That's our culture. You can never be forgiven. If you cross a line, if you break a rule, if you do something you shouldn't do, they'll just throw you on the trash heap and move on. You must be deplatformed and silenced and relegated to censorship if you say the wrong thing. Our culture, which cries for tolerance, is often short on redemption and grace. And so we rightly say Christ is the antidote for those far from God. But there is another group who Jesus came to save, and it is those who are constantly concerned with projecting the perfect image, never falling from grace, being seen and known as one who says the right things, posts the right things all the time, and upholds a perfect public persona, perfect family, perfect work-life balance, perfect bank account, the carefully curated Instagram presentation of your life, the Facebook photos that you edited and posted of your good side, this one, by the way, as opposed to the tagged photos, which have the double chin, you know, the real photos of your life. Uh, That's your inner Pharisee coming out. And Jesus came to save you from that life, too. That's a difficult way to live, isn't it? You know, you don't have to live in Hollywood to feel that pressure, to be held captive to the same struggles of desiring a persona that is deeply loved by the public that has nothing to do with who you really are. So if that's you today, you need to know that Jesus came to free you from the captivity of living under law when grace is available. Now, maybe that's for you the actual Old Testament law. Maybe you've got your book out and you really are going through the laws every day. But maybe it's also you trying to live under man-made societal pressures that Jesus never asked you to live under. Either way, it's a pressure on your soul that you do not have to feel. Jesus came at a law-keeping fever pitch in Israel, so much so that Pharisees were making up new laws to keep. Imagine being so bored with keeping the 613 that you decide you need a few hundred more because you're bored. When Galatians 4.4 says Christ was born under the law, that's no joke. Christ wasn't just born under the law. He was born at the Pharisaic fever pitch moment of the law, following him around, watching him, popping up from from grain fields and saying, I saw you touch that grain on the Sabbath. I mean, following him, right? So when we say Jesus was born under the law, I mean, he was under scrutiny day and night to be perfect. Imagine if Jesus was born in one of those times in the Old Testament when, you know, those times when they fell into idolatry and they didn't know even where the copy of the law book was. Imagine that was when Jesus was born. I I bet he could have reformed it. I trust that he could. But still, the purpose of Christ was to be born in the strictest time of adherence so that he could say, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And then everybody's supposed to gulp and say, well, then who can do it? Here we are. Jesus had to fulfill the law himself so that God's righteous standard could be satisfied. And then rather than point people back to the law that he successfully kept, he pointed people back to himself and says, follow me. Make sure that this Christmas you are following Jesus and not a laundry list of rules. Following Christ will ensure you live a life pleasing to God, and it will also keep your eyes on him rather than the crushing weight of the law. We have seen the auspicious arrival of Jesus into the world affirmed by the ordering of history. Secondly, the solution to the law. And lastly, we affirm Jesus arrived as a blessing to the world, as a blessing to the world. As Paul was making his argument to the Galatians that they not make law keeping a salvation requirement, he evoked a covenant that predated the old covenant. When we say Old Covenant, by the way, that's a synonym for Moses. When people say Old Covenant, they mean Moses' law. Now, Paul is going to go back farther than Moses' law 
and go to a covenant made with Abraham that predates the old covenant. So let's continue on Paul's train of thought, Galatians 3.29. He said, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Now, I promise you this would have ruffled a lot of feathers to say those words. Uh, the prevailing opinion, especially in Galatia, with this church, but everywhere where they struggled with this, was that Gentiles, uh, when Gentiles came to faith in Christ, they were truly saved, but they were a separate group. Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians were being treated as two different groups in the Galatian church. And you can imagine how that would possibly happen where the Jews knew the law and the Gentiles had never even heard of Moses. And that would be an easy thing to hang over the Gentiles' heads. You know, we're God's people. We're the chosen people. You guys just kind of found your way in here. You know, you stumbled into the right room, I guess. And then they might say something like, don't forget who's got the actual blood of Abraham in their veins. Now, you can see how that would be tense. And Paul says, no, hold on now. If you're in Christ, you're actually a son of Abraham, an equal heir to the promise. There is no distinction between Jew or Greek. If you've been an idol worshiper in the Greek temple of Artemis every day of your life, but throw it all away and trust in Jesus Christ, you are instantly adopted into the family of God, and you are participating in the covenant of Abraham. So you are spiritual Israel the moment you place faith in Christ. That is revolutionary. This covenant that came before the law of Moses made a promise to Abraham that a blessing would come from uh, his bloodline, which for all of biblical history, we, we just understood that to be Israel. That's because that's what it looked like. The presence of God's word and him meeting with them in the temple and everything that happened in Israel was, was the blessing of God in Israel. It was always like, you, you want the blessing? Become a Jew and move to Israel. That, that was just kind of how it was. But... We learn from Galatians that the blessing in the line of Abraham would expand far beyond Israel and find ultimate fulfillment in Christ. And anyone, anyone can receive the blessing given to Abraham by their faith in Christ. If you look at Genesis 12.1, I'll read it for you. It'll be on the screens. It says, this is the covenant, by the way. Now the Lord spoke uh, to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. Listen to this. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The question you have to ask is, how would that happen? Christ came at the right moment to offer the Abrahamic blessing of God, not just to Israel, but to anyone who would believe. He came to bless the world in the original way that God had promised. He came to offer salvation to the world, to adopt people into the family of God. He came to graft people into the bloodline of Abraham by faith. And here's the fundamental difference between the covenant made by God with Abraham and the covenant made by God with Moses. The covenant with Moses, the law, had an end date. It had an end date. We just read earlier in Galatians that when Christ came, that was the completion. Everything, everything was to point to him. But the covenant with Abraham has no end. It has no end. It was put in place to forever bless the line of Abraham through the blessing that would come, who we now know is Christ. And we also know that this was God's plan all along to bless the world through Christ. So looking back at our key text in Galatians 4.4, 4, it says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit 
of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. Look at what God accomplished in sending Jesus in the fullness of time into the world. He completed the requirements of the covenant with Moses, a.k.a. being born under the law and kept it, never failed, not once. And that gives you and I freedom. He fulfilled the covenant to Abraham by being the promised blessing into the world and then extending the benefits of those blessings to everyone who would trust in him and then adopting those who have faith in him back into that family. He blesses us by giving the eternal inheritance promised, putting the spirit into our hearts that testifies to our sonship. And this is an often neglected part of our salvation. We rightly maximize the fact that we are sinners incapable of saving ourselves, that without intervention from God, there's no hope for us, and that's true. But I do want to make sure we understand there's another element to this. Yes, God snatched us from the fire, but he also gives us blessings right now and into eternity. He gives us the privilege of calling him Father. That's a blessing now. He gives us the Holy Spirit of God. That's a blessing right now. He gives us adoption into his family. That's a blessing right now. And he gives us an inheritance in heaven for eternity. And that's forever. God wanted to bless Abraham by giving him a land and a nation and then wanted, always wanted to extend that blessing out to the whole world. God wants to bless the whole world through Jesus Christ and the expanse of the kingdom of God, the proclamation of the gospel to all peoples. And that starts on Christmas Day. And so when you sit back and think, about the auspicious arrival when Jesus entered the world in a manger stall in Bethlehem. That fullness of time. All of those historical moments aligned to give Jesus and the gospel the biggest impact possible. And we see in that God doesn't just use history. He ordains history. The Son of God came into a historic moment that was ripe for his arrival. We also see that he arrived not just as one of the prophets, not just as a good moral man, not just as a great rabbi, but that he came fundamentally to solve the problem of the law, the fundamental problem of the law, that nobody can keep this albatross and it's on our backs. Can anybody help us? Jesus came, said, I got you. Follow me and you will please God. We see Jesus came to fulfill the covenant to Abraham, to be the promised blessing to his line, to extend that promise to anybody who would believe. By faith, anyone can be adopted into the family of God and get the same promise given to Abraham. You can get it in your heart by faith in Christ and be adopted into his family. And this all happened right at the moment it was needed most that would have the greatest impact at the fullness of time. And some of you may say, just like Jesus came into the world at the right time, that Jesus came into your life at the right time, that he got a hold of you at the right time, that he poured out his grace on your life at the right time. So if you're trusting in Jesus, I hope you take the time to praise him for coming into your life and giving you salvation and an eternal place with him just as much as you celebrate his first coming into the world on Christmas. Because the fact of the matter is that he came into that manger stall in Bethlehem so that he could come into your life and be your Savior and Lord. If you've never given up control of your life to Jesus Christ and trusted Jesus to save you and offer you forgiveness of sin, your auspicious arrival moment is today. The king of the universe wants to know you and save you and adopt you into his family and give you an eternal inheritance. So would you call on Jesus to save you today?